And great. Let me just verify that we are on Facebook Live. And yes, we are. So, all right. Excellent. So, can you can you hear me? Can yes. Hear you cannot see you. You cannot see me. Um, I, I can. I, I can see you. I cannot. You can see, see me. me. I can't uh -huh. see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, is this live? Yes, it is. <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everybody, Hi. for joining us. <laughs> Everyone's here. Who You're can back. See? You're back. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the perils of trying to do a virtual event when there's a storm in New Orleans. And that's what I was going to suggest we start with, yes. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our special event this evening. As Sergio mentioned, um, we are coming to you live from New Orleans. And there is currently a tropical depression in the Gulf of Mexico called debt. Wow. And it is um, raining and it hasn't really started storming yet, but it's, it's raining kind of hard today. So um, we may have some issues with the connection and everything, but we're believing that it's going to be a perfect evening and we're ready to get started. And um, Community Book Center is most honored to be hosting the um, the launch of Dear Sendran. Did I say it right? Sendran. Sendran. Um, the memo the Black Spirit Memoir by Akweke Meza. And I am going to um, turn it over to our moderators and let the show begin. And I just also want to add that we are very, very excited um, and would like for everyone to join me in wishing Brother Sergio a happy birthday. And this is how he's spending happy his birthday. birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you for spending it with us. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. So welcome, y'all, and everybody. Let's the show on the road. Thank you. And so as Mama Vera said, because of the inclement weather, uh, if we do happen to click out, the feed will not end. So please be patient. I will switch over to my phone. Uh, should we then lose the, the Wi-Fi coverage? The cell coverage should be fine. So just please bear with us. Uh, incredibly proud uh, to be able to host this. Thank you for the birthday present. Um, and uh, so I will uh, be in the background and uh, welcome everyone. So, uh, wonderful birthday. Thank you, thank you for the, for the greetings. Um, thank you so much and uh, I will check back with y'all uh, and have a great program. Awesome, welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining us for this Dear Sandra and event. I'm here with the amazing Tanais. Um, and Catherine Ajima Egard. And uh, they are, well, we're all going to read, I think. Um, I'm going last. So <laughs> who wants to go first? <laughs> I have something very short. I'm happy to go first. Okay. Catherine, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, honored to be with you tonight, both of you. So thank you. Svaha, the last utterance of a mantra. The last word in my Buddhist one, Om Tare Tu Tare Ture Svaha, which I chant every day. In Tibetan, Svaha means so be it. In Sanskrit, well said. Named after a nymph who wanted to love the great Vedic god Agni, a minor goddess as they're called. But I see her as necessary, like the kindling that clings to the fire, letting us see the beauty of the flames as we feel the warmth. I'm drawn to fire. I describe my energy this way, the part of Hindu traditions that drew me in were the sacred fires of the Havan, where offerings were burned to the gods. I'd always imagined that I'd marry beside such a fire, but I didn't. I married beside the ocean. I grew up in a faith that forbid idols, forbade goddesses, 
and we should know no divine besides Allah. But what is ancestral never dies. Perhaps, and so this utterance, Svaha, reverberates, returns to me a pre-Islamic abode within. I think of what's left of us, a message here or there, nothing too unsettling, but even these are like little embers of wildfire, enough to spark a blaze. Svaha, the femme inside the flames, the last breath of a mantra meant to be chanted by men. The end. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I spent the last two days reading your book. Can we say a minute? Oh my god! <laughs> Fine. Oh, that was that was such a beautiful reading. I got chills Thanks. listening to it and hopped into the chats because I was like, I need to yell, and I'm on mute here, so I will yell in the chat. It has Thank you so much. Hours. I'm. Thank you. <laughs> I'm so excited for. Is that an excerpt from Insensorium? It is. It is. When's it coming out again? Two, 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 two. February twenty. Yes! Oh, I forget you have that magical date. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, two, 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 two. Everyone, Tanya's book is coming out, and now we will switch over to Catherine. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I wrote a quickie, a letter. Dear a quickie. It is probably on the same day that I am to read it to you in public, but here I am, prone to responding. And I think you like surprises, or certain kinds, good ones. I'm writing this at the Grand Canyon on a piece of notepaper scrounged from the gift shop. Gift shops are everywhere. Everything is for sale. I think about being in another national park at Yosemite and learning from reading the work of Julia Parker, a renowned Miwok Pomo basket weaver, that the Indian village was burned to the ground in quote-unquote routine fire exercise. Although the landscape is entirely different here, the gift shops, the hotel, and the layout of the restaurant are eerily similar. I cannot help but wonder what else has burnt where I now stand. In the book, Scrape the Willow Until It Sings, I learned two things. Julia also worked in the gift shop and later in the museum where she demonstrated basket weaving, enabling us now to learn from her. All these histories bound together. A park ranger stands in front of the entrance to the rim trail, asking as people emerge how far they managed to go and whether they saw anyone passed out on their way down. Sometimes we have to send helicopters, yeah, she says when we ask. It happens pretty often. A fragment on the sign before the trail reads, people tend to overestimate their physical fitness, dot, dot, dot. Skew is not a guarantee. Okay. Quickie, you are the only person I have ever met who would set out on a trail like that with reasoning, well, if I make it through, I'm fit enough, and if I don't make it, then I am dead, so. I am staring into the grooves of the canyon, and I think about how many words I don't know for what I am seeing. And also, if I knew the words for what I saw, I would see things better. Language, a technology that enables and excludes. And though I must say I prefer the language of flowers, the tensions and speculations and geometry of the stars and the planets, I also know that living things become sacred herbs repackaged at a Sephora sticker. That observation of the sky come plot to sell oxygen to the wealthy, and astrology is whittled down to sun sun compatibility easily. You get the point. The language is how we make our living in the empire. You with increasing publicity, because that's the way it works. There's literature and there's publishing, and you do both. The confusion about how to protect the process of either literature and its creation, and the struggle to make sure that a work finds a public and is not erased, is in perpetual peril because of that same old thing. Everything's for sale in the gift shop. For me, writing, yes, and talking for hours, language is talking to hours to people I have learned to call clients, to deal with the volume and grief that means living in America, with a healthcare system that is what it is, and with trying to remain open to being with others and not just who has enough money. 
me learning to use language to try and hear what is underneath, to hear and to listen to pain and neglect so much of it with little outlet except sometimes at me. Sometimes I feel we are speaking to each other from opposite ends of the world, opposite ways of dealing with language that are still the same, and yet this truth is still true. When everything is stale, it's very hard to see each other, much less to speak. I learned to rely on herbs. Yarrow teaches me the edges of myself, my favorite ally for listening. It shows me myself show surfing a flood. I look up pictures of fat surfers, compelled by the feeling of the flower in my body and loving the ocean. And I imagine myself oiled and painted like Jimbo Pellegrin. Marguerite grows eight foot tall bay leaf trees, which protect us and have granted me wishes, sweetness and love. When you were in the hospital in 2019, after that suicide attempt, where Anne, my brother and I came to see you, Marguerite dreamt of time. She described the leaves on the phone, told us how to use it to cleanse you, put it at your bedside. The morning after your suicide attempt, we both had readings, one after the other on the same day. They were both glamorous in a certain way that comes with a poster and a promise of a career. Mine in a synagogue turned community center, yours in a bookstore where a tree emerged through a skylight. No one could tell, I hoped of myself and knew of you, that the night before you were getting your stomach out of pills. But again, that's how it works. It's not meant to be visible when there's work to do. You were dazzling as ever, answering questions. Your publisher sent a car and paid for our dinner. And you laughed and said they were afraid that you would die. I have been afraid too, and I had to learn to stop it being afraid in order to see you. Because it, because it is true, death is often close to you. And I am reminded often in the frailty that others don't get to see that is close to all of us. The years preceding and surrounding 2019 were marked for me by suicide attempts and psychiatric emergencies of people I loved. Diagnosis after diagnosis, word after word, drug after drug, but not a question asked that I had to learn to become clear enough to ask and to listen to what has happened. Why do you want to die? What follows that answer is often hard to bear. Sexual violence, war, hate, discrimination, violence that hurts your inside and that makes you bleed. It is not a metaphor, it is not. Often the shroud of death or illness or poverty that marks an individual is easier to turn away from than what has created it. That's the question that comes up often in a society of individualism when faced with pain, with another person's pain, is why are you doing this to me, to us? Why can't you just be happy and content? Oh. Difficulty oh. is easy to mark and hard to change. I'm almost done. Glamours are seductive for a reason. And here I am, a Saturn in Capricorn speaking to a Saturn in Sagittarius. We cannot see each other in this system, I see. We must find a different mode of relating, of speaking. Until then, I will not engage. And you, to me, to everyone in return. I will be seen, even though you don't know how yet, even though you don't know the language, even though you don't know the words. You will see me as, my know, as I know myself. I have learned to ask you and myself, how do we want to die? And that answer is richer, far richer than I first imagined, because it forces me to imagine all the ways in which I might live, in which we are living. Speaking of Saturn, I am taught about legacy, about bones, fossils, canyons, mountains, what remains after we're gone. I have turned towards the canyon, imagine all I cannot know, and yet all that it shows me. One day, I would like to make it down to the bottom of the mountain. I am busy preparing. I can prepare indefinitely, which you know. You remind me that the sun is setting, that the vulture circle, that it is getting hot and then cold. And at the bottom of the trail, if I dare, there is water. Then you will be too exhausted to speak anymore. Wow. Wow. <laughs> this is my, my 
So y'all just want to talk to me. That's cool. That's cool. That's cool. That's cool. That's cool. That's cool. Hold on. I'm, echo I'm hearing myself echo. Am I echoing for you guys too? You are, but that energy, I was feeling the cacophony of joy. So <laughs> it's going to work. Thank you so much for that, Catherine. Yeah. That was spectacular. And also, Catherine had hit me up before and said, I want to run the letter by you. And I was like, no, I'm going to lie in bed and watch a baking show. You read it at the event. I will hear it then. <laughs> Because um, I wanted, I wanted to hear it for the first time. Um, I also love that somehow both of you ended up reading things about fire and things about the ocean and things about death. Um, I hadn't decided what to read at all, so now I am opening a page. Part of this letter, Pain, Dear Daniel, because that's what Catherine's letter made me think about and because she's in it. Um, so this is from Pain, the letter, Pain, Dear Daniel. A few weeks after my surgery, as you were killing a wasp in my kitchen, I told you how the procedure had been an unmasking, showing me as someone who had been hiding exposing how much comfort I'd taken in a body that masked my deviance, and now I had gone and broken it all open. I was showing myself, and it didn't feel safe. And, you added, it's a mask you can't put back on. Mm. And it's a mask I can't put back on. And that hurts. It feels raw and flayed and foreign. I am tired of this flesh, what it needs to feel right what costs that comes with, the litany of ailments that march through its cells. I am tired of hurting, of spending months recovering from something or the other, bruised and swollen and exhausted. I want to be strong. I want to be free. I don't quite know what that looks like yet. One night while praying to Allah, I pause on a line in the prayer. Narawi yinkim. Accept my gifts, it pleads. I think of what I have given lately. I glimpse the surgery as another angle of obedience, turning into the slick, smooth snake chest, scars rubbing like scales. I think I wanted to write this letter because the pain has been such an important part of these years. What story would be complete without it? People wait for me to get better, and that doesn't really happen. I begin to understand the commitment of the word chronic, the way it marries itself to you. I learn that I will disappoint others with my lack of wellness, of capacity, of ability to explain to them the intricacies of what the fuck is happening with my flesh that renders me unable to perform the way I used to. I forgive myself for letting people go because I am trying to hold on to myself. I learn to be okay with the stories people have about me. Some of them might even, might even be true. I don't need to be perfect or liked all the time. The pain is demanding and it takes up a lot of space. I am a ragged thing and yet I have a community of people around me who care for me when I am suffering, which is no small miracle. Maybe that's something the pain has taught me, that I am not alone. Someone sits with me in the ER for five hours and we eat bows together afterward. Someone drives me to the pharmacy as I bleed through my shirt. Someone flies in from New York, from Los Angeles, from San Francisco, makes my eggs the way I like them, catches my head when I collapse in the driveway so my skull doesn't smash against the concrete. Someone oils my scalp and makes me butternut squash soup and stops me from driving to Target with drains in my chest because I wanted to buy a fake banana tree. Someone helps me wash my hair, builds shelving in my office, changes the poles on my kitchen cabinets from steel to brass. I am a ragged, imperfect entity, and yet there is a community that holds me when I am in pain. I didn't expect embodiment to come with grace like this. I just wanted to say thank you for being my friend. Thank you. 
where do we go from here? <laughs> infinite, infinite places to go. I mean, Akweke, you had mentioned um, on social media that you wanted to talk about this idea of arrogance and interrogating that. I don't know if you want to jump right into that. Um, Let's I jump would right in. Love to. <laughs> um, as a human reading the book, uh, as a person who shares South Asian diaspora with you, the author of the book, uh, as a spirit first person reading the book, a lot of things come up when you're reading. And when you're a reader, you're still a writer. So I think for me, reading the work, um, and feeling the infinity of spirit that permeated the work. The idea that some people walk away feeling that that which cannot be contained when it is named is arrogance. It felt like a very human path to take through feelings that came up when reckoning with the infinite. And I think maybe that's because as humans, there's some sort of comfort and humility. And I don't know if that's just a cowering or a safety or a protection, but I would love to know when you get feedback or see readers reacting that way or reviewers act reacting in that way, what comes up for you? Um, because for me, it just feels like it cannot, that cannot contain the infinity and in what, what that's permeating the work. So I'd, I'd love to hear from you how that Thank feels. You. It's so hard talking to y'all because y'all be dropping like these little lines that I want to like jot down <laughs> you know, like the, uh, the thing that cannot be contained that is named. And I was like, wait, what? Hold on, I want to write that down so I can come back to it. Um, Here, write it down in the comments. <laughs> thank you. So I think for me, it's like, it took me a really long time to unfold. And that's really what the whole book is about, right? Is how hard it was to unfold, how difficult it was to unfold. Um, how much pain that had to be worked through in the middle of the unfolding. And it's always a little surprising to me that like, you know, can read all that. And, and then Kirkus, for example, was like, you know, some readers might have a hard time with like the arrogance. And I was like, that's what you took from it. <laughs> um, and, and I always, I really like reviews because I, I don't think this might sound terrible. Um, I don't think, well, actually, no, it's not going to sound terrible. I don't think they say as much about the work as they do about the person who is mm. reviewing the work. And that's why I'm always interested because it's actually a window into the person. Um, and then I'm just curious. And Catherine is someone who I really appreciate in my life because she's taught me the use of endless curiosity and just so many questions. Like you can just have endless questions and you don't have to have answers to them. And I'm like, oh, this is nice because I don't have to answer them. I can just ask the question. Um, yeah. And so it, all these questions come up, like do people react to the arrogance specifically around the parts about publishing because it's like pushing a button for them. I don't know what button it's pushing because it doesn't, it doesn't get pushed. I don't have that button. It doesn't get pushed for me. Um, but also I think there are a lot of assumptions that are folded in um, that I'm curious about people unfolding, like even within themselves. So when you talk about arrogance or when you talk about calling yourself a God, for example, and I think people think of it like as like Kanye being like, I'm a God. Um, and, and really I'm like, what does that mean to other people, like what do other people think I'm saying with that? Because I, what, where I'm coming from is this, so in Igbo reality, if a deity stops work, like it's a, it's a two-way relationship between a people and a deity. If the deity stops working for the people, you can destroy the shrine and just break up with the deity and just be like, oh, no thank you. Um, and so from there, for me, a God is an entity that is in service to a community. And mm -hmm. even if you say you're a God, even if other people call you a genius, I'm like, what does that mean materially? You know, like, does it mean that I am more deserving of resources than other people? No. Does it mean that I'm better than other people? What does better mean? 
no. And so I'm like, if you're saying these things and they don't mean these other things, like, okay, fine, you know, with writing, if someone is a genius writer, so what? Does it mean that they deserve to make a living from their work? while other people who are not classified as that shouldn't make a living? I'm like, no, everyone should be able to make a living from their work. And so what are the values? What are the material, like tangible things that lie behind the things we're saying? Um, and in the book, I'm also, I think, I think that people have a hard time holding the arrogance in the same space as vulnerability or as tenderness and i'm just like well yes you can say that i'm this incredibly arrogant writer who talks about their work this way and moves through the world this way i'm also the entity that is bleeding through my shirt and collapsing in my driveway so what now what do we do <laughs> like okay and <laughs> like where where does this go if I'm, if I'm both of those things, if I'm all of those things, and and I think, I think there's flattening there, you know, in either direction, where it's like, well, if you're vulnerable and if you're vulnerable in these ways, then people are like, okay, you're weak. Um, and I grew up like that, you know, I grew up with everyone saying you're too sensitive, you need to toughen up, you can't live in your bubble forever, and I was like, watch me. I absolutely will. <laughs> um, and being seen, as, like a lot of people who've known me for a long time would describe me as like, oh yeah, you know, they're genius, but they're, they're not strong. Um, and I'm like, yeah, I'm like, okay, so we're seeing vulnerability, we're seeing sensitivity as weakness. Um, but then if I tap into, you know, the God, like, not the God side, because there is no side, but just into the knowledge of power and flexing it and just stating true facts, then that is seen as, it's like you lose, you lose either way, you know? And at this point, I am I'm just rambling. Catherine, you're, what uttering, do you think? you're uttering things that people really feel is all I wanted to add to that. You're saying what I, the things that you're describing, I'm like, is that not what every writer wants or wants to conjure? And you just named it. Does that not liberate me to read that? So I just want to put that little perspective in response to what you said, because you're naming these what we covet. And that's so that's not done very often at all. Catherine. <laughs> oh, um, I'm just listening. I think, yeah, I mean, I think um, I mean, I can't help but like do this kind of larger thought, which is like capitalism loves extremes. Um, you know, an extreme of wealth, an extreme of brilliance, an extreme of untouchableness, untouchability, and then, you know, being frail and weak. And you, you move between those poles, people move between those poles, but you in a very extreme way, partly because of the energy with which <laughs> you exist in the world. Um, and I, I think, you know, some of the critiques that you're talking about, like, I, I think one thing that I wish, and I want to ask a question to both of you, is that it were more normal um, to, to write about oneself or to learn how to speak about oneself. Because when someone says, so-and-so is arrogant, I'm, like, so interested about, you know, exactly what you're saying. Like, why is this an important thing to bring out? Like, why, why right now? What this? And I... You know, I don't think that writing, I think, as you're saying, is limited to like a specific group of people who are able to write for a living. But like having the ability to like draw out that thought of like, why is this bothering me? Is something I wish everyone had the privilege and was also encouraged to do and to be heard. Um, I think one thing I, I want to ask is like, you're so like, I read your so speaking of genres, you're both writing in multiple genres. But I, I think one of the questions that I think about with you quickly, and I think um, as you're releasing a memoir, which I'm guessing is in the first person, Tanais, is what it looks like to live from 
different genres, but to move from fiction to nonfiction specifically and to really ground yourself in the eye and all that it enables for other people to see versus how fiction, um, you know, encourages different kinds of um, critique. Does that make sense as a question? So, a quickie, do you want to answer first? Or? I'm not gonna lie, I dissociated for like two seconds and missed the end of the question. <laughs> it's like fiction, <laughs> moving between genres. How does that feel? Um, you know, it's so interesting that Freshwater as a novelist, it opened an, a new portal for me. And here was this debut. And we actually did an event, which had a very strange framing, which I disagreed with, but we did an event um, and that was when the mental health and mental illness issues were kind of focused on. And I was like, that's not the focus of this book. Like, that's not what I got from that book. Um, but within that book, there is moving between different just points of view, plurality, it, like the I, the we, the, you know, there's so much moving across um, just how you center the narrative. And that felt very liberating for me as a reader. And then when I was kind of thinking about my next novel and then this book, I was like, I want to unleash my first person narrative voice. Like in my MFA, I also did an MFA where I was, I was the only person of color in my year. And this is at Brooklyn College MFA. And I very, very much vibed with what was written in Dear Sandaran about how it feels to be a little gaslit, very gaslit in an MFA program. To know that my work will be published. I had that knowledge the whole time I was in that program and people were like, oh, well, you're writing really commercial stuff. And I'm like, that's rude. You know, I'm writing my truth. And to move into first person, it, it's almost like I've read a quick in an interview say the opposite of what I'm about to say, um, how Freshwater opened and made the ground fertile for Dear Senduran to emerge like you did. So I feel like Bright Lines didn't do that enough for my work and Insensorium is making the ground fertile for my fictive imagination, which is very wild and cannot be contained in the MFA or white literary publishing spaces um, that isn't even on this physical earthly plane only. So. To me, I think all of our works are building on one another to make our readers and consciousness more fertile for more of that to proliferate and grow from. And I see Dear Senderan and Pet and Freshwater in this cosmic dialogue with not only each other, but to the readers who are seeing the work expand and grow. So. I found first person very, very liberating um, because it's me. And I want the world to know what my voice unfiltered sounds like. I want the world to experience that, not through only fiction. I think nonfiction, there, there's a veil that is lifted and then you learn how to work with other masks and veils, which I think is the epistolary structure of Dear Sundaram does that so beautifully because every person you're writing to is giving us a different energy from you we're seeing a different side of you because those people and beloveds and fellow spirits see a different side of you. So when you're talking to the lover who broke your heart versus your fellow spirit versus your mom, who are we experiencing? That's what I think like is so powerful about nonfiction. It keeps evolving throughout the work. Hey, I'm so excited for Insensorium. I'm like reading all the little excerpts you put on Instagram like very greedily and I'm just like, come on. Um, so I think it's going to be fantastic. Congratulations in advance. And um, for the genre thing, you know, I think because for me, the genres I work in are in my head like wider than like fiction, nonfiction, because I write YA romance at this point, um, poetry, working on fantasy. And there was, when I did the, the Ascender and launch, 
with Saidiya Hartman. Um, she said something about Freshwater that I wish I had heard when I was doing PR for Freshwater because it was such a wonderful phrase. Um, she said that sense that in Freshwater it decenters the human protagonist, Ooh. and I was like, yes exactly um because there were so many people who were like oh you know i would have liked this book more if it had more of the Ada's perspective and i'm like the entire point of the book is to not have more of her perspective because she's not the center of it um and in writing the memoir i wanted to write you know unfettered um and i also wanted to think out loud, but think safely. Um, and the only way I could do that was to write to my people, where I was like, okay, I don't have to explain anything because we already have all the context. And I can like edit the book generously and throwing, throw in a couple of letters that didn't really need to be in the book, but that contextualized stuff. And even when there was like spirit stuff that that we, even when there was spirit stuff like the letter on mutilation that I was giving context for other things in it, I was like, okay, how would it sound if I was talking to a human that I want to write to versus like the unknown human reader where it just becomes more general and flattened and then everyone's like the reader and they really mean a white reader and that's not what you mean at all. Um, and so in moving, you know, between the genres, I think each of them does something different for me. But then again, each book specifically does something very different, regardless of the genre. Like Freshwater was an entire restructuring of my whole life that I was doing as I was writing the book. Um, and then Pet was an exercise in like imagining the future and imagining possibility for young people. Um, and Vivek was an excuse to write about the Niger wives, quite honestly, but also to play with this idea of reincarnation where the gender doesn't match up the way that it does in some of our stories. And so the, the books, you know, continue like that. The romance novel that's coming out next year was mm. this thing where I wanted to write a book that had a soft landing where, you know, it would, you know, it's going to end happily because that's, that's compulsory in romance. It has to have a happily ever after. <laughs> and I love romance for that. I'm like, we need soft places to land. Um, and with Dear Sender and I was like, I'm so tired of pulling my punches. That's really what it was. I was like, I am so tired of pulling my punches. Um, and one thing I learned from when I was a kid is that I can be good at many things. And it was just a fact. It was something my parents like told me. And I think it actually ties back into the um, the thing we're talking about, like arrogance and excellence and all that. Like I write in the memoir that special isn't special to me because it's a baseline. Um, I was raised by parents who were just like, who were, very, were like, you are extraordinarily intelligent. And they didn't mean it as a compliment. They said it with exasperation because they were like, you coast. They were like, oh my goodness, you coast so much. Like you don't work hard because you know you don't need to. And they're like, imagine what would happen if you tried. And I was like, but I'm doing so well, not trying. Why on earth would I try? That makes no sense. Um, the first time I ever flunked a class in veterinary school, my father was happy about it. And I was like, why would you be happy I failed out of the class? And he was like, now you know what it's like for other people. <laughs> he was like, now you know what it's like to actually have to study. Like you actually have to work. And then it turns out he had failed the same class when he was in med school. Um, so we bonded over that. But one time I was having like dinner with my mom or something and she was talking about my sister and I. And she said this again, not as a compliment, um, but with exasperation. And she was like, the problem with you children is that you're extraordinary and you think it's normal. And she was like, so done with us in that moment. And like, that's how I was raised. That they were like, you're extraordinary and you, uh, it's irritating us actually the way you handle it. Um, and, and I think about how that, you know, ties in to grow up knowing 
that you are extraordinary, whatever that means, um, which in my case really meant that you could do anything if you decided to hard enough. Um, mm -hmm. and, and then to finally start trying to do it, right? Like you said in the MFA programs, to know that you were going to get published, like to know all these, to know things that you had no evidence for, but that you knew anyway. And then you find, and like the minute you actually, you're like, okay, cool, well, let me, let me step into this. And then you find out how violently people push back against that. And I mean violently, like. Yeah, they want to erase people. you, silence you, annihilate exactly. you. And then, and then you get into the habit of learning how to pull your punches. Because now you're like, okay, but if I try to move the way I am, mm -hmm. I'm going to get punished for it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get humiliated. I'm going to get targeted. Like there are all, there's so many, so many things that are done to us for that. And with Dear Sender, and I was just tired. I was like, I'm tired of pulling my punches as a writer because, well, because that's actually what I had been doing you know, was pulling my punches as a writer. Freshwater was me pulling my punches as a writer because if I wasn't pulling my punches, I would have written it as nonfiction. But writing it as fiction, I was pulling my punches. And like, and for people, they're like, like they don't see that a lot because they're like, oh, well, you know, Freshwater was this and that. I'm like, yes, and it can be both things. It can be the text that it is. It can do what it did in the industry and it can still be me pulling my punches. Um, and, and quite honestly, I'm not sure if writing on, like if I was like, oh, I'm just writing, you know, Unleashed from now on, I don't know if I would write literary fiction. Ooh, tell us I more. What would you write? Genre that I would work in. Go ahead, Catherine. Say yes. more. <laughs> tell no, us I what you would write about. <laughs> Once a question came out of my mouth, I'm also kind of bored with this division of fiction and nonfiction. And I like I think maybe one of the questions that's coming out of it is like if we didn't have these kind of separations of like speculative fiction, nonfiction, yeah. literary fiction, whatever, mid market fiction, whatever, like how what are the different ways that you um know that you're writing differently and with different centers, which you answered um, and I think you know, if you if you're moving to, um, I mean, you have like four books coming out, um, and they're different. I mean, they're like they're like evolutions onto themselves. But I, I wonder, without those definitions, like what kind of um, yeah, like what kind of difference is worth thinking about yourself? Um, and I don't know. Yeah, I'm not saying anything. I'm asking a question with no answer. Wait, I um, missed the last part of the question. Did you catch that a quicker? The question mm -hmm. had a question. Um, <laughs> I think it was just like if you're like if we didn't have the constraints of genre altogether. Yeah. Yes, yes. Then how would that change? Would that change how you yeah. write? Or would you read? Or are there different genres that you would define for yourselves? That's a great well, question. I, I love that question. And if I, I want to add to that question, um, the heartbreak for me, honestly, because I just went through some stuff, like that permeated the Friendly One for me. Just like the whole arc of the magician and your deep heartbreak and betrayal. Um, and now you're going into romance. There seems like catharsis there. I don't know. Like, did it feel different to move in that direction with love. What is love to a spirit? How does genre kind of allow you to play with this idea of love? I don't know, I just, I felt that pain like reading that. And to me, that was one of the core vibes of the book as I was reading is just how one is taken to the depths of hurt and then resurrects themselves becomes reborn is shedding is no longer taking that shit and then in romance it's like the clouds so i'm like the genre question to me i would love to know in regards to love and romance um versus the heartbreak not versus you know what i mean parallel to the heartbreak i would love to know about that yeah um 
So for me, it was like, you know, again, when we think of these ideas of like what arrogance looks like or what strength looks like, or like you said, what does loving a spirit look like? Personally, for me, my thing is just don't lie to me. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's a hard and fast rule. It's just like, I have zero, zero tolerance for it. Um, and one of the things that I think was heartbreaking about writing Dear Senderan and really, you know, facing it because I wrote the book right as the heartbreak was happening. Like the suicide attempt that's detailed in the book happened in September, 2019, which is when I was on tour for pets. Um, and I wrote, and I was writing the book already and I just folded that right in and finished the book like three months later. So I was like writing and editing and like, pro I was like processing everything in real time. And I think the heartbreaking part for me was that, you know, so much of, of the book is about this difficulty with embodiments, um, the, how hard it is to stay alive, you know, the fights with death and and in the betrayal that's written about in in the book, I'm just like, there are things I say that, especially recently, that people always try to gaslight me about and say, you know, oh, you're exaggerating it. It's hyperbole. The fault is not on the other person. The other person was not actually being violent. You know, you keep bringing death to things where death doesn't belong. And I'm just like, death does belong there. Like, you know, like Catherine said in her letter at the start, like we are dying. You know, we're having to witness each other ricochet off death. We're having to, you know, sit with each other in hospitals after people cause us harm that will directly, it's a straight line from that harm to our death. It's a straight line. Um, and and people try to deny that so much and try to lie about it and cover it up because quite honestly, when someone's trying to kill you, you're not going to sit there and be like, yeah, I'm trying to kill you. I mean, I would if I was trying to kill someone, but apparently people don't believe in just saying the truth. <laughs> um, and so, you know, for me, I think part of the heartbreak was understanding that in this reality, even when people say they love you, even when they say they see your spirit and you feel seen by them, it will not stop them from trying to kill you. Um, and that's why I write romance because I'm like, I can write a better reality. I can write a better love than what I've experienced in this reality. Um, and, and I also realized after the betrayal that my creation of people was quite honestly better than the person themselves, at least romantically. Um, and, and I sat in that because I was like, it, it's not just that I thought it was better, it was that the other person also thought it was better. Like they were like, yeah, that's who I want to be. I want to be that person. I want to become as golden as you see me in your eyes. I want to be as brave. I want to be as kind. And then, well, and then they try to kill you. And everyone finds out very horrifyingly that they can't live up to a golden mask. And I was like, oh, okay. I should really stop putting golden masks on people as much as they love it. Um, it will kill us all. So in romance, I get to, I get to create a love that is better. I get to create a love that is actually kind, a love that is actually honest. Mm -hmm. um, and and in honestly, and I think because it's in a book, because it's in a story, it's immortal. You know, I've, I remember when I got divorced in my very early twenties and I thought it was unfathomable. You know, like my ex-husband and I were deeply in love. He said one of the best things about getting married was that he would never have his heart broken again. And we were so wrong, <laughs> you know? And and that's part of what I write about in Dear Sandra and in the impermanence letter is that humans have created ends. There, there are no forevers. And 
as a spirit, specifically as an Avanji, like that was very much a shocking thing to me. Like I did not realize that until the fall of 2019 when my therapist said, and then I wrote an entire chapter in the memoir dedicated to it because I was like, what? How could you, like you only have a few decades left to live and you can't guarantee just making something last for that long. It's not even forever. It's just a few decades. Um, and so there are a lot of things that like being in a mortal form and being embodied, I've learned about, and I'm just very upset, like constantly very upset about them. And it's not the kind of thing you can go and talk to a therapist about and be like, hey, so spiritually time does not exist. Um, and so I am very disturbed by the idea of ends and the idea of permanence, of impermanence or other. Um, and so I turn to the other, like to these other stories, I turn to romance in fantasy, you can make anything happen. You can, all the limitations of the flesh can be lifted. You know, you can shape shift, you can do things that are rooted in spirits and pull them into this reality. And you can do it on a, at a volume that we don't really get to see. Um, and so, I don't know if I would ever name like a specific genre because I feel like I'm moving around, just flitting around to whichever, like whatever stories I need to tell in the time. I know that with literary fiction, you know, after Freshwater, the next, I wrote two novels after Freshwater. One was Vivek and the other one is not out yet and not announced, but it's been written. It's been written for years and it's gonna come out like years in the future and everyone's going to be like, wow, a quick case literary fiction has progressed so much. And it's gonna be like, no, actually I wrote that ages ago um, because with each novel, I had to find a way to stop being bored. I had to be like, okay, what's the challenge you're giving yourself with this novel? because otherwise it's just such a boring linear story. So with Vivek, you know, it's written backwards. There's a secret that's held until the end. Um, the next novel is written within like a 36 hour span from like seven different viewpoints and time stamped scenes. Um, it's chaotic, but I needed that to, to keep my mind engaged. And with Dear Senderan, and when I'm writing like spirit first stuff, that fully engages my mind. You know, I always say that like working in spirits is like my my like core, th like my favorite field of specialty of work, but it because it engages my mind, you know, fully. And then when I step into something like fantasy because I'm creating an entire world, again, it's engaging all of my mind. Mm. I want to be cognizant of the time because I think we're yeah. supposed to end at 7.30? I'm not sure. Um, but we have a question from Soraya saying, greetings, can you please talk a little about the deep influences of your inheritances, of your inheritances, of your cultural and ancestral lineages? And I'm going to make Catherine go first with that. If I can. I think it's a question for you. Um, I think I, I, I think it's a question for all of us, and it's my book event, so I guess it's this back. <laughs> my, uh, my partner is like laughing at me in the background. Okay. Um, I, I don't, I'm very skeptical of language, and I'm not able to answer this question correctly. Um, I think that everything that's worth saying is worth saying in a book, um, or like with the amount of time. So. Um, to these two other authors who have written multiple books already, I turn it over to you. <laughs> oh, Catherine, so diplomatic. <laughs> I um, know, right? There, yeah. All right, you go, I, So I just don't know how to not write that. So I, I feel like for me, the ancestral lineages um, are so much more evocative for me because we're still living in that. Like I am inheriting so much bounty and loss and violence. How could I not write about the imprint on my being, on my body, on my mind? And living in this country in particular, in the United States, there is a sort of um, constant invisibility, erasure, nothingness that I grew up accepting as a part of my identity. And I don't even like to sit with that because that wasn't my reality. That was just like, 
the external reality of the world around me that just didn't comprehend the 10 letters of my country's name or whatever, you know what I mean? Like they just had no uh, understanding. So to me, to talk about Bangladesh is to talk about India, is to talk about Islam, is to talk about Hindu, is to talk about Buddhists, is to talk about all these confluences that are very syncretic. Um, and the way that Akweke kind of, the word spirit, you know, that utterance of spirit to me syncretic spirit is where I find and draw from and feel power from because that is an ancestral lineage that lives on in me. I just didn't know how to name it. And I think my whole life will be spent trying to hold that, name that, yearn for that, reach for that. Um, meeting fellow kindred spirits who are often writers. Um, I'm a perfumer too, so I'm using fragrance to do that. Um, I'm making jewelry to do that. Aquik is wearing my jewelry to do that um, because I believe like, you know, just as you said, Akweke, books are artifacts, they're eternal, um, but they're also ephemeral. They're also like, if anyone stops reading or they continue reading, you know, that's the lifespan of a book, but then it's always waiting to be discovered. Same with material culture and objects. Through material culture, including books, I have found my lineage um, and the abundance and loss that comes from that lineage. So I just don't know how to write outside of that. Um, I think another thing that I just love about writing in this time, this time with Akweke, um, is really writing beyond the scope of the market. I think like the market is very limiting. Um, and we see how authors act when they're coddled and kept in the market. So. <laughs> To be free of that, uh, I won't. <laughs> I won't go more into that necessarily. Um, but to be free of that is so powerful. It is beyond any industry or market. And I think if you can hold to that, and I, the way that I'm trying to, that Akweke has, um, in Catherine, the work that you just read, this letter to Akweke, I felt that lineage permeating. I, I think that's where writers of color. Um, can find so much power. And I say the phrase writers of color very loosely. I'm just saying like, you know, people that are writing outside of the scope of a white middle-class readership that has been the focus of the market. Um, so I very don't know, sort of my... I, I, we have like two minutes. I love that answer to Anais and I think maybe my um, resistance in answering is also to say that I think uh, my heritage is present in my material production. Um, and that's ongoing and forever. And I, it's hard to just, I don't think I do justice to things sometimes. Mm. Of color, oh my God. <laughs> Thank so you. I don't know. I don't know if this is going to just automatically cut out at the one hour mark. So we're just going to keep going um, until we're stopped. <laughs> um, and and I think you know. What you're saying about the market is so true. I think when you're writing, when you're writing spirit first, when you're writing past any like imposed constraints, it's also terrifying for people. And when you see people lashing out, a lot of them are lashing out from fear. You're restructuring worlds. You know, you're creating things that they don't understand. Um, and I think this ties into the other question we got, which was, can you talk a bit about anointing, divining oneself and drawing connections to the unmasking? I've been thinking a lot about the performance of a true self and performance of an untrue self that one wants people to believe is true. I have a whole letter in Dear Senderon about masks that I recommend for that because it, it talks about masks as a, as a true face um, rather than the idea of a mask covering an untrue face. For me, you know, I've, in Dear Sandra, I also think a lot about the idea of an essential self and what that is and whether it's a mask covering that. And where I landed with it was that I have no essential self. It does not exist. It is just a void. Um, and so any mask that I put on over a void then calls forth a face. So all my masks are faces. So if you put a mask over emptiness and then it summons up whatever comes and shapes itself behind the mask, and then you have a face. 
Um, and I think there's a lot of power in forming yourself. There's a lot of power, there's a lot of power in naming yourself, especially in, um, in Igbo reality. I don't have ancestors and I don't connect with lineage because it's, it's, I could talk for like an hour just about that because it's a whole thing in Igbo ontology where like humans are in a reincarnation loop and for you to have ancestors, you would be part of the loop. Obanje are not part of the loop, they're interlopers. So they don't have ancestors because they're not actually part of the loop even though they're born into it. However, you can become assimilated into the human incarnation loop as an Obanje if you have a child because then you have contributed to the lineage and you get sucked into it. Also, this is in Dear Center, so you can go read it there. Um, but because of that, it's left me not really caring about legacy as well, because I'm just like, no, 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 I'm just here. Give me my flowers while I'm here. Like everything, I don't want to achieve things after I'm dead because I'm not there, so it doesn't matter to me. And also people do such terrible things to you when you're dead um, and, you know, use it to absolve themselves, use it to gain like points. Like, oh, look at us. We gave a posthumous recognition to someone. It's like, now nah, maybe you should have recognized them when they were alive and it could have made a tangible material difference in their quality of life. And maybe they wouldn't have died at that point because they probably died from capitalism and how trash this world is. But that's another point. Um, but I think naming yourself is part of anointing, is part of divining yourself creating your own face, um, there will be a lot of pushback against that because people fundamentally understand that naming is power, especially if you're an entity like an Obanje or something like that. Like part of the thing that colonialism brought and all of that is taxonomy, which is that I point to you and I say, you are this, and I will identify you by these characteristics and you list the characteristics like it's the DSM or something, but you point and you identify and that gives you the power because then you named and you took it away from that person. Um, and so when you are the entity naming yourself, people get furious because if they can't name you, if they can't anoint you, then it fundamentally shapes <laughs> their perception of their own power. Because then it's like, well, if I can't do this, then you don't need me. And if you don't need me, if you are not dependent on me for your for validation, for your career, for your success, for a thousand other things, then to them that's power. You know, is power over over someone else. Power because you know, there's something I think it was was it Maya Angelou that said this? in an interview with Dave Chappelle, of all people, but um, she was like, because Dave, I was definitely Dave Chappelle, I think it was Maya Angelou, but he asked her, <laughs> what, <laughs> he asked her, like, what do you do with people saying that you're great and you're all of this? And she was like, oh, I don't pick it up, because if you don't pick it up, you don't have to put it down. And that's the thing, if people say what you are, then if they make you, then they can unmake you. And fundamentally, I'm just like, no one can make me, not even myself, quite honestly. Like I am made by spirits, I am made of spirits. So no human can unmake me, no human can take away my name, no human can take away what I am by denying it like it's it's all futile but you'll see them flailing and you'll see them trying and you know the memoir talks a bit about that because it is difficult to hold your center when people are so forcibly trying to remove you from it that's a beautiful note to yeah. <laughs> hold it all honestly i mean we could talk forever <laughs> Thank you for this work. Um, thank you for your friendship and love. Like, it's so special. I think the you know audience will agree. Just like reading the letters to you, Catherine, and then your letter to Akweke, and being in presence of that, it's very beautiful and powerful. It, it's like the healing that we need. Um, thank you for what you just said, Akweke, as well. So, thank you. Thank you both for being here with me.
Um, yes, you answered that because I was like, I don't know how to close this out. <laughs> I do not have the capital C. <laughs> so let Mama Vera take the seat. Speaking of mask. <laughs> <laughs> That's a super cute one. Yeah. Again, thank you all for joining us. And um, Akweke, Catherine, and Tanais. How do you put it, pronounce it? Tanais. Tanais. Yes. I guess I should get that my grandmother's name was Anais. It's exactly Tanais. like that with a T. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Tanais. Got it. Thank okay. <laughs> um, thank you all for um, participating in this discussion with us this evening. Thanks to all of the people who joined the crowd and came in to um, participate as well. And on Facebook Live, we appreciate your presence as well. Um, we do have the book uh, available here at... <laughs> That's beautiful. <laughs> Community Book Center, in addition to the other titles. And we have uh, signed copies. So do come by and get your copy. It's a great gift to share. So we appreciate Akweke for making those um, autographs available. And I did try to order the two of your books, um, but was unable to. But as soon as they become available, I'll make them. Um, a part of our stock and inventory at Community Book Center. And um, we'd like to invite you to come back at another time and do an event with us. That would be amazing. Thank you, Mama Vera. Thank you all so much. You all have a great evening. Um, I want to say that tomorrow we're having um, a full day of activities for Juneteenth. We're opening up with a children's event on um, at 10 o'clock from 10 to 12. I Wish for Freedom by Monique Lorden. Just in time for Juneteenth, I Wish for Freedom. We also have a book, it's Sickle. Mm -hmm. Awakening the Truth About Sickle Cell Disease. And tomorrow is also World Sickle Cell Day. So we want to bring awareness to sickle cell anemia. And this book by uh, Jennifer Fletcher, along with our very own Doctor for the People, Dr. Corey Abair, will be um, on site signing copies of this book and they will be available. And then we also have one of my cohorts, uh, Tracy Taylor, launching her book, And I You, um, in celebration of Juneteenth and Pride. So uh, we're having a full day, and that's from, uh, Monique is from 10 to 12, Dr. Abe is from 12 to 2, Dr. Abe and uh, Jennifer Fletcher and Tracy is from two to four. So we um, invite you all to check our uh, Crowdcast schedule and join in for these discussions on tomorrow. And we just like to also make you aware that we will have activities throughout the day on Bayou Road. All of the businesses are participating in Juneteenth. We'll have the baby dolls at Whiskey and Sticks um, Son of a Saint is uh, doing a major blood drive and yoga and other activities. Uh, Half Shell, Cupcake Fairies, uh, Cocoa Hut, all of the businesses are planning special activities. So join us at uh, Bayou Road, um, our website on um, Black Bayou for um, information about that and the museum, the um, museum store that's connected with the McKenna Museums will also have activities. Again, just check our um, page for more information. Have a great night, everybody. Those here in the Southern region, 
stay dry, be safe, and we'll see you tomorrow. Thank and you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> happy birthday. Thank you. Beautiful spirits. Thank you. Bye, everyone.